Hello, my name is Dr. Walter Nekinel Gilpin, the Managing Director for Kirk Commercial Bank, and I am a professional. So, welcome to the show, Dr. Gilpin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, how have you been? Ah, uh, hanging in, man, doing what I got to do, trying to make a living. Okay, so um, this is the Mid Professional Show, and um, firstly, we want to actually congratulate you as um, quite recently you have been listed as one of the top um, 50 CEOs in the continent. So we want to congratulate you for that. It's a great achievement. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so let's start with your professional journey. Viewers will, will want to know um, Dr. Gilpin's professional journey. Well, thank you. Um, I must say initially that I give all the glory to God for where God has taken me from and brought me. You know, I am a, I'm a, an economist and... Um, a banker. My professional journey since I left college has been one wherein I worked in the central bank. Okay. That's the Bank of Sierra Leone. I worked in the research department. I worked in the international um, finance department. And also worked on the banking supervision. And during that era, we worked quite extensively with partners from um, developing agencies like the World Banks, the IMFs, the African Development Bank, okay. Commonwealth Secretariat. You know, worked quite a lot with external partners on building the economy and so being a fresh guy out of Fribe College you know University of Sierra Leone at that time uh, we didn't have much about IPAM or we didn't know much about JALA we knew more about Fribe College and okay. the orientation there was quite rigid you know so we came out there really strong and I believe we were able to stand the test of time by pairing up yeah. with yeah. international economists as it were okay. international bankers as it were and that's why I started my my journey and uh, from that stage I was able to move on to the international stage I mean after doing my my masters came back home then of course the war was around and during the war we had a lot of issues as okay. we all know and I moved out and got opportunities out there oh, yeah. then I started working internationally where I was out for about 18 years okay you know and then came back home well, when I was out, I mean, I was out of the country per se, I never came back home. I used to come home on mission, you know, like join missions with the IMF, the World Bank, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the FDB. So we had our regions that we used to work on, working on public finance, working on public sector, working on banking sector, okay. working on economic issues in countries. So I used to come to Sierra Leone as part of teams before. So I did have a, uh, a knowledge of what was going on. Okay. I was working within the system. And then eventually I came back home in around 2017, I came home and I was working with the, a project run by the European Union. All right. I did that for a bit and then I went to Gambia to work on a project for the IMF. Came back home, completely, continued working with the um, European Union project. Then we were actually building up the PFM framework for Sierra Leone. It was quite pivotal um, at the time. I think it still is. Okay. You know, and then I got called up for some interviews and discussions to work in the um, should I say in the economic sector, you know, and then I got this job. That's my history. Wow, um, that's a marathon of a journey, you know, fresh from graduate, from college, and um, you got an opportunity to work. And but that's very much um, inspirational. But um, I'd like us to touch base on the aspect of you being the MD of the Rocker Commercial Bank, and um, quite um, recently you've won a lot of accolades. But we want to focus on. Um, under your leadership, you've been able to steer the ship from one level to a level of growth. So, viewers, we want to know what's 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 the 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 energy like when you were appointed as MD to the growth that you have actually created in this institution. Well, I must say there are two major pivots to that. One, on the fact that I came from a background wherein no is not again for an answer. You cannot give excuses. You have to perform. Okay. From the Bank of Australia back in the day to my international exposure, you just cannot take no. You just do not see difficulties as showstoppers. You always see an opportunity out of a difficulty. You always see a challenge as a, as, as, as a platform to give you an, uh, a chance to demonstrate that you can be a problem solver. So okay. I had that kind of orientation. You know, like um, I had a friend who used to work as a security guard in the Bank of Australia years back. He was an ex serviceman. And he would always say to me, civilian sickness. Civilian sickness. Look. They call it and they, they work as so, so call it. 
you know and so at that age his comments used to really impact me okay that you know you have to be who you are but be more assertive and aggressive about more what you do professional yeah. you know yes and so i saw this guy always telling me how civilian are sickness and i mean he's so irritated having to work with civilians and then also you also have the background wherein you work with I mean, uh, people of high stature, you know, I worked with the governors, I worked with the Minister of Finance, the Permanent Secretaries, we'll do the paperwork for the country's budget, we'll do the paperwork for the international negotiations. Yeah. And at that level, you cannot be seen as steady and mediocre and lethargic, yeah. you know. And then going outside being international, you know, then you have to compete with people of different ethnic backgrounds, different race, and, and your work keeps you going. So coming home now as the MD of this bank, I had that background to me. And I then came to a situation where, to be quite honest, I felt like a foreigner in my own country. Because, <laughs> I mean, people really waddle in mediocrity quite a lot, sad to say. Um, they also are comfortable giving excuses, they're comfortable at seeing difficulties, and they're comfortable at majoring in minors. These are things which got me in a very vexatious spirit. I don't like to see people majoring in minors. I mean, you spend most of the time gossiping rather than thinking, rather than strategizing. Yeah. You spend most of the time going out to have a drink and to bump around. And the conversations are not even edifying. Conversations are about who did what, who looks like what, who's dating who. Those things are completely the funny things. Yeah. Completely out, you know, of the sink of, of economic development. Of course, yeah. So uh, that's the first issue I found. And how do I change the status quo, the psychology, to get, get people to understand? Look, we need to talk about issues, about concepts. Well, look at possibilities yeah. of growth. And then also, being out there, I realized that there was a perception of location about Sierra Leone, which was rather negative. And you, 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 you find out that people would come around and they want to come to Sierra Leone, but they have a background of a place that is set back, it's brutal with war, backwardness, and disease. And so I thought, if I ever have a chance to change that status quo, I would like to play my role in that way. And I left that to God Almighty to, to guide me through that. So coming back home, I found a challenge. I mean, here was a bank that was reeling under its own level of, should I say, misfortune? Maybe, okay. um, uh, um, I don't want to use the word mismanagement, but let's say it had, it had, it had a bad streak, okay. all right? And now you're given a task to change this bad streak, turn it around. And I realized that I was sitting on a pot of gold and it's right in the middle of the central business district. It's one of the most highest valued real estate around this area. It has a history of over 100 years of banking from Barclays to Rockwell Bank. And he had staff who'd worked here for like donkey years and uh, put all the, the years of expo experience, experience yeah. together in the bank. He'll have over a century of experience. And yet still, they walked with their heads bowed down, the shoulders called over, and there was no pride. So I thought, how do you get pride back to these people? And then secondly, the sector is really real with um, com competition from outside. Of course, highly and competitive. Yes, highly competitive. And so the perception of location, we see us as weak people, people who could not um, formulate, who cannot articulate, who cannot uh, strategize, who cannot, who cannot capture our opportunities. Yeah. So I thought in my little corner, what can I do to change this around? And that was the impetus with prayer, trusting God, and also the blessings from the executive, because I am here, I'm a public servant, and so after blessings from the executive, say, go ahead and just do your job. And so with that, then we decided to go ahead and just do the job, and that's what really gave me all this push that I have. And I think I'm also a patriot. I am a, I'm a proud Sierra Leonean, respective of all the odds and ends, I'm a proud Sierra Leonean. I'm critical of my, myself, so I'm critical of my people, where I think we can do better, I will I'll state it. I say, boy, not Salomon, I say, Mr. Salomon. Yeah. We can have Salomon people who have an urge to be different. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. And this is the background to it, and that's, I think, is a kind of summary of why yeah, I'm so I, I think I think it's good because you mentioned a few things, more especially when you come back home, you see a lot of people dragging feet in terms of um, even the attitude that people have. Mm -hmm. You gossip a lot. But what's, what makes your leadership style different? Because, however, as, a, as the MD, you have a lot of people working with you and you have a lot of people following you. So what is unique about your leadership style? I think I am, uh, I am uh, somebody who is rather, I'm a calm person, but I'm very assertive. You know, I have what I call a stubborn determination to get things done. And you back it up with um, fundamentals, you know, with um, reasoning, economic reasoning, or with whatever you have been trained to do. Okay. Look, I mean, for the military man, the best form of defense is attack. Yeah. All right. And that is the military's trade, and that's what they're trained to do. 
So you come out here now as a banker, as an economist, in my own profession, I think I have to attack also. You know, but then how do I attack? You know, the weapons are different, the strategy is different. But you have to, first of all, create a mindset within the institution that the people who are working for you got to believe in themselves. And so you got to equip them, to train them. Yeah. So initially, spend a bit more in, in training. Because I realize I'll attend meetings and I will attend seminars and I'll see the foreign people, you know, articulating better than my people. I'm thinking, why should it be like this? You find that people are not confident enough. They can't walk with their shoulders up and they yeah. can't walk with their heads up. Yeah. And they always have this feeling of the guy from over there is better than me. Yeah. So you need to turn that around by giving them confidence, yeah. by training them, by letting them see leadership by example. And of course, nobody is a custodian of knowledge 100%. Nobody is uh, um, uh, not averse to errors. So there must be the, the, the times when you can have uh, a tripling over. Yeah. But you get up and go. Yeah. So I had to make sure the human resource capacity was really looked at. Started training people, exposing them to seminars, public speaking. And one thing which I introduced was uh, that morning, 7.30, once a week kind of session. Okay. I found out that staff couldn't even speak. They couldn't even do PowerPoints. They couldn't even put together a summary of what they're doing. So once they realized that, yeah, they're on the spotlight, started doing it. And then they realized, oh, I have more in me than I really thought I had. Yeah. You know, and it was, listen, now I can speak. Oh my gosh, I can fly, I can, I can run. And so they said, discovering themselves. Yeah. That was the first stage. Yeah. Second stage is start building up the profile, the portfolio of the institution. Okay. And then getting it out there to the public. So this is your bank. It's a bank run by Sierra Leoneans, first run by Sierra Leoneans. I know this bank was perceived as granny bank, as crew in the, in the sense like crew granny, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of, you know, Tangil's bank. Yeah. You know, online banking not there, digital app not there, everything, paperwork, paper centric, very manual, sluggish, all this kind of thingy. No, I can't continue like this. You know, look, nobody wants to be associated with failure. Of course. Everybody yeah. wants to be associated with success. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wants to see creativity, everybody wants to see dynamics. I want to see a push. want to see things look yes, different. Yes, about yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. You can't walk into a location, a locality, 10 years back and walk into it 10 years ahead and you see the same thing but in a worse state. You want to see improvement, incremental course, development. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's called the Kaizen philosophy by the Japanese. Yeah. It's generational growth. growth. And that's what you need to see. Mm -hmm. You can't come here and you see a rundown place. Yeah. And it's called a bank. And you go next door, you see banks pitched up by foreign, foreigners, the tents pitched there, and they're doing better. And it's just like in the church. I'm a Christian, so I can tell you about the church. In the church, you find out that you had many people going to Boxton, St. Anthony, the Catholics, all of a sudden came the charismatic preachers from overseas. And then you see the people moving from the St. Anthony to this charismatic church patched along some hill yeah. and having this Bible thumping mm -hmm. preacher coming from the sub region. Yeah. And you see the same thing, another one over there, and they're wondering why are all the church members all going to these new churches? Same thing with the banks. Everybody who was an account in another bank had before in Roquel or Barclays, Commercial Bank or Standard Bank. All right? And then they all moved away. Why? Because people allowed. Yeah them to move away a that particular age group so i'm thinking look here first of all lost customers because we were not as we we're supposed to be and then the younger generation also grew up not knowing these local banks as strong entities but yes still right, they right. can be strong entities so yeah. you have to target them again let them know that look you can come to us we can give you what it takes and that's what we're building now because i don't say come to me because i am a local bank i am a Israeli. no 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 come to me, i can give you what you can get anywhere else with precision, with finesse, and it's accurate, it's safe, it's secure, okay. and you can bank as we are banking with Lloyd's Bank or Barclays Bank or Citibank or any other bank. So I want to give you that kind of service. That's why you should come to me. Okay. And when you realize what I'm giving you is equal to a better than what they're giving you down the road, then you will come to me. So I thought, look, let's start building this thing. It's not, you can't change overnight, yeah, of but course, you have to be a change to be a agent. You have to be a difference maker. Yeah. And you have to know that one, you have to leave a footprint in the sands of time for the right reasons. And you back that up with the intellectual, with what you've learned, what you've observed over time, and then you can make a big difference. And that's what I think I wanted to do. By God's grace, I'm still trying to do that. I think um, uh, it's very much impressive because for the fact that you are that people-centric leader, it allows people to buy into your vision. And that's what, what's important about leadership. You want to have people following you because they want to, rather than they have to. So I'd like to hold the conversation there. We'll go for a short break and we will be right back.
So welcome again to the Meet Professionals TV show with me, your host, IBKB. Well, I'm here um, with Dr. Ekundayo Gilpin. We're discussing about his professional journey. And we've highlighted a lot of issues about how he became a professional. So welcome again to the show, Dr. Gilpin. Thank you, Prof. So we were discussing about um, your leadership style and how you were able to transform this institution from one level to another in as much as there are a lot of challenges in the banking sector. Now, in as much as you are a people-centric leader, let's, let's, let's divert the conversation to what are some of the challenges you are faced or you're still facing with managing people? Um, well, you need, you need to like situate every institution into the culture where it resides. Right. Um, the Australian culture does impact on the overall ability to demonstrate more or less efficiency, proficiency, because you come from a background where people need to be pushed, you know, from background where people need to be encouraged, from oh. background where people need to be shown that they have a talent. So that's the first area where you have, I think I have a mismatch of what I expect and what I, what I the reality, used yeah. to see. Yeah. Because probably everyone was afraid, is afraid of the boss. You don't have that level of comfort with the boss. The boss may not be as open to you. Because there are various reasons to that. One, if you are so open, people want to exploit it. Two, if you're not that open also, people think that you are... Uh, Maybe don't, too too you, rigid. Yeah, you don't so like I, them. Yeah. Yes. So as a consequence, you you find you, you found out that you needed to get people to understand. Look, we're here to do a job, okay, and we're here as professionals. So your view is as important to me as the most senior person's view is important to me, no matter your level in the organization. So let's get that right and let us be able to talk. Okay. Secondly, people have to be able to ex be able to express themselves. You know, people want to just keep quiet in the meetings because the boss is there, they don't want to talk. At the same time, you have to control that, yeah. um, uh, that situation, it doesn't get out of hand. But people could be free to express their views. So the few areas that we had to work on, getting the confidence of the people to be able to speak up. Yeah. And then also you have the other area wherein there's this very dogmatic layer, autocratic level of control. Yeah. You know, I came from a very laissez-faire economy. I came from a background where people speak, we call ourselves, by first name, yeah. I never knew who is SGO, is MBO, is CEO. I knew everybody by name, no yeah. matter the level you're at. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I had to contend with was being called MD when I came home because nobody to call me whatever I was over there. Everybody first name, but it's a different culture here, so you have to know that's how. The yeah, people are forced about titles yes, in this part of the exactly, world. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so that <laughs> you have to just accommodate that. Yeah. You see, and then the other thing now would just be the whole thing about loyalty and cabalism and being afraid of Tom, Dick and Harry, you know, wanting to say I'm close to this person because they punish me if that happened. You know, all you have to come all of them, you have to manage the situation quite yeah. well. And then you need to begin to get people to believe that look here, your work is what's gonna sound you out. Yeah. Okay, I don't care your shade, your color, where you're from. If you work well, we're gonna pick you out and we're gonna reward you for good work. Yeah. And then the next thing was getting people to be together. That went a lot to what I call extracurricular activity. Yeah. You know, the jogging, yeah. the exercising, the sports events, social events. You event. break the ice. You just break the ice. Yeah. And everybody sees, oh, okay, we're going to do a tug of war. And I'm, I'm there one team. If you can pull me, pull me. I knew I exercise a lot, so to pull me will not be easy. Yeah. But let's go and try. You know, so yeah. we go for tug of war, we go for football. And the COVID, of course, reduced that a bit. Yeah. But probably that helped to bring the whole unit together as a team. And then that level of efficiency. You know, I come from a level of very high efficiency. So you come before me with tidy walk, with slip short walk, I'll tell you your walk is not good enough. And that may make you feel uncomfortable. You might not want to see me anymore. But I'll say it to you, yeah. and in land, you got to do your work better because where I'm from, you cannot be mediocre. You cannot be exceptionally, you cannot appear to be exceptionally stupid. You know, and so that's another area I had to get people to understand. Look, I will correct you if you're wrong. I'm also open to correction. But you can't come here, you're at you this level, and you write like this. I say, you can't, why do you write like this? Or why did you say what you just said? Let me understand you better. It yeah. makes no sense to me. Maybe you can articulate to me. Yeah, better. You yeah, know, yeah. so with that kind of um, rapport, people understood, okay, well, look, whenever I come to, to MD, he's going to think through what I'm saying. He's going to pick out a comma, a full stop, and then cross a T, and I'm going to get on your case for that. Why? Because you have to go to a level that's beyond, I want to go to a level that's beyond this the confines yeah, of your yeah, comfort zone. Yeah. And if you're going to go there, you're going to meet people who are well-groomed. Yeah. How are you going to stand up and talk with them? See, the other thing which I realized also, okay, I'm working in the bank. But look, most people don't realize the bank is part of the financial system. 
And as being part of the financial ecosystem, the financial system is comprised of this, 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 like banks, stock exchange, um, 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 in, in insurance companies, investment firms, and so forth. And there is one output that is critical for the financial sector, one, returns of earnings to participants, and two, to boost GDP growth. So if you know you're in a system that has to boost overall GDP growth, you know you're in a system that has to bring returns to the participants and you walk towards that end game. It's not only about coming and being a glorified bookkeeper, taking money from the treasury, cashing it, giving, paying to people, balancing your books, putting back. No, 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 no. We offer a much bigger role okay. than just being an operational institution. Yeah. That's what we talk about the bank sovereign interdependence. And that's why I brought in my knowledge as an economist and as a banker, you marry those two. So my whole perception to the game is different. Because I know that when I'm looking at something in the economy, I want to see where can I come in as a bank? So one thing I look at may be the money supply. Okay. What is the overall actually impact of money supply? Interest rates. What does the, the interest rate change due to the exchange rate? Yeah. And how does the exchange rate ultimately impact on net exports? And so I know that from my interest rate gain, I'm going to impact net exports. I know that from my interest rate, I'm going to impact what's called aggregate demand. And I know that also from my moving around of mobilizing currency, mobilizing deposits, mobilizing time and saving deposits, I know I'm impacting what they call M2. M2 works really from the monetary side of things. Okay. But yet still a bank has a role to play because they have currency in circulation, and they have time and saving deposits, and you also have um, 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 M2 and M3. These are all monetary, I guess, but the bank sector plays an important role there. So I'm looking at, okay, what does the government want to do? They want to trigger what they call velocity. What is velocity? It is basically M2 over GDP. Or you want to work with intermediation to give out loans. You know, and what is in, in intermediation? It's the inverse. Okay, yeah. which can be GDP over M2 or the other way around, I'm not really sure. But when you know we're looking at all of these factors, so as a part of the financial sector has to impact on GDP growth, the financial system, sorry. And then it has to bring returns to earnings. And then it has to work with things like the M1, the M2, the multiplier things, the monetary things. Then from the fiscal side also, what does the bank come in? You know, they look at fiscal aggregate demand is C, you know that, plus I, plus G, plus the, 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 the exports. Consumption investment. Yeah. How do I play with those things as, as a bank? How do I trigger growth? By intermediation. All right? And how do I impact M2? By getting more time and savings deposits to the bank. So I operate one, returns to earnings, that is to make profit for the shareholders, all right? And to yeah. give them the returns to overall GDP growth by helping in pumping out you yeah. know, things for intermediation. And then you come to the ordinary banking now that is looking at financial inclusion, financial depth, access to finance, financial access points, financial literacy. These are all facets that people don't talk about. Yeah. So I come here as a banker, I'm making sure the bank is running well. All right, of course, one or two slips could happen here and there. Making sure I understand the bigger picture of banking. And I look now, what would I do with access to finance? Are there financial access points? And I can go and build brick and mortar all over the place. So I look at technology. How do I piggyback on fintech? And how do I bring our mobile apps? Agency banking. How do I work with the regulator? Online for, banking. You know, yes, banking, online banking. Yeah. And all these things have to come out as a package yeah. for a banking solution to offer to the masses. And that's where the beauty of it comes in. People say, oh, I never knew banking could be like this. Oh, I thought banking was it. Then you walk within what I, what I call a cash-centric economy. It's cash-based. Everybody wants cash, cash, cash. And then you think, all right, how can I let people understand that you can do your hairdressing and pay with your phone or pay with a card or pay with your watch if you have Apple money? How can I let people understand that? Yeah. Which subset of the population am I going to attack? Because when you want to look at a, a change, a structural change, structural change are changes that don't happen overnight. It of takes course, some time. It takes pro process. Yes. So this can be stages. a generational change. Yeah. You know, if you find out that the population is mainly old, then look, look, what do I do to get the young people to understand that both population is old? So it's a structural change. I cannot change that overnight. Yeah. So the other things I started to look at in my little corner, I go home and I think, tomorrow, what am I going to do? Okay, walking down the step, I saw that person there. I think that person can be better off if you move them over there. And you come back, you face resistance. You deployment. You say, ah, who's that is come out? You know, I remember the time we changed the logo, the bank logo. I mean, this, this is the old logo. You know, that's the old logo. Yeah. This is the new logo. Yeah, yeah. You know, what, we were sitting right in this room. I think I just done like three weeks. And then we said, when is the next meeting? We had a meeting on that table. What's the next meeting? And I looked here, they had a bank calendar there 
for the date for the next Mijanis. And then I saw this thing. He was, I said, what is this? He said, it's a logo. I said, what does it represent? I said, we don't know. <laughs> I said, I'll find out. Then I said, let's change it. Said, ah, it's my Chris. Eh? What's your company? I said, we're going to change it. Then I realized that it has mountains and valleys. And I said, this is for Ministry of Tourism. They should not be the Martin and the Valley, not the bank institution. I know it's called Roquel, the river and all that, but let's just show a financial institution. Set up, set up a, a tax force to grab our chain in the logo. I mean, of course, the rest, the rest is this. And this, I mean, uh, Agib is about the most popular logo in Sterling right now. Yeah. We came second to Orange as far as brand perception was concerned last year. Yeah. So the brand name I has changed. I read the changed. article, yeah. Yes, yeah. and also the logo change. It gave a picture of a financial institution for crying out loud. I'm not saying the old guys who did this were, were wrong. They thought it like this at the time. Fine, well and good, but times changed. Yeah. So when I came in, that's what changed. And with the logo change, came a whole new bath of a new vision, a new energy, a new determination to take the high streets, to reach out to the competitors, and also to let the, the shareholders know that you can give you value for your money. It's not been an easy road yeah. to come out from a position of loss, massive written, written earnings, negative over 100 billion, to take it to a position of now where we have over 50, 60 billion written earnings. It's a wonderful experience. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that it seems it is. We, we, we read a lot of articles and um, we know exactly how um, things are changing when it comes to the financial position of the bank. You know, so we, with all the challenges that you've highlighted, it tells you that people become very much important towards achieving the vision. You know, so, so now this moves us to um, another sensitive path, a leader, there are definitely skills that one needs to be equipped with in order to be able to drive change, in order to be able to manage people better. Because you once mentioned earlier on, if you, if you are too lenient with your, with your employees, they want to tend to take chances. And if you appear too strict or too bureaucratic, they tend to be scared of you. So, so what skills one needs to be equipped with in order to manage people better? Mm, thank you. I uh, believe a leader has to be a visionary. A leader is a risk taker. A leader is also um, a key. You can be a people person, you know. And if you have those three things together and you also understand the area that you're operating in, then I think you can start moving things. Okay. You need to be able to say, okay, look here. We've been walking a straight line to the door every day. If we take a bend around, around the curve, Okay, along the way, we'll find some people there that we can bring along into the bank every morning. Yeah. Now, changing the route is going to be quite a shock to the people who used to walk in the straight line. Exactly. Some would resist, some would frown, or so make fun of you. When you walk around the cover and you bring four, five, six people in and they see that happening, maybe they'll all come right behind you. Yeah. So you take the risk. What if I don't get the five, six people? Then what if I don't try at all? You know, and then there's not going to be any motivation, there's not going to be any difference, and it's going to be the same status quo. So the leader has to be visionary. Yeah. And then leader has to sell the vision to the team. And the team has to have a managerial level that can then understand that vision, translate it into action, and Might help the leader to, to that, execute yeah. it. Exactly. So that's what the leader is supposed to do. That's what I try to do. You know? And then also the leader, as I said before, has to take the risk. So you are putting your neck on the chopping block. If you go wrong, you're alone. Yeah. If you make it right, then everybody is with you. So you take that risk. And then the leader also has to have quiet time to sit and think. If you believe in God, you pray and you work hard and you try to think of what next can I do to make a difference. So I believe that when you go to a location and you come back a year down the line, you should see something different. Otherwise, why are you there? Yeah. The other thing leaders should never accept is Naso we blend one. When ah, I tell that, you, that's catchy. I don't want to know how you did it. Otherwise, why am I here? If I sit here and I do the way you've been doing, then there is no reason I'm here. You can just that's, one of, that's, that, that's a very big problem in our, in our cultural setting here. Indeed, indeed. That's how things have been operating, and indeed. we have to just follow suit. Yes. People indeed. don't believe in change in this part of the world. Indeed. You know? I can tell you a, a real story. Some time back, we came on a mission here, and we had an Australian guy with us. I'm talking about maybe 2004 or five kind of time, or six. And we, we were in the Ministry of Finance, and this Australian guy was doing something on the computer, and this Australian said, that's not how we do it anymore. You know, that methodology is wrong. And the Australian said, that's how we do it here. And this one said, no, 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 it's no longer acceptable. You do it this other way. And the Australian insisted, this is how we do it here. And the Australian guy said, okay. That's how you do it in Sierra Leone. 
All right, then look outside the window. He said, we didn't understand what he meant. He just said, look outside the window. So he said, look outside and see the chaos. See the disorder. Yeah. See the filth. That's how you do it here. Yeah. You know, he didn't need to elaborate. He just said, look outside the window. And that stuck in my, my mind. Look outside the window. So if you see something that's not really working well, and it's in a so bland one, and you also continue doing it that way, then you've you, added no value you, You're to, part of the problem. Yes, yeah. you're part of the problem. Yeah. So no, I don't, I don't mind if you change it when I'm gone. But once I'm here, we're going to do it my way. If you want, you yeah. can reverse it back after I'm gone. Yeah. When I'm here, I'm going to do it my way. As the Americans say, either you come my way or you take the highway. Wow. <laughs> you know, so as a leader, you have to know what is your way. Yeah. But pray God that you get it right. There's a fundamental difference and a perceptible change positively in what you're doing. Great. Um, I think um, we're actually um, getting to the end point of this particular interview now. So now, in just a few minutes, what are your guiding principles of life? Because your principles are very much important to shaping the type of leader you are now. So what are some of your principles? Well, fundamentally, I believe in trusting God. Okay. I believe in trusting God. I mean, I believe a lot in my scriptures. And as a Christian, I, I know particular scriptures that stay in my head. You know, and that's one thing. And two, I believe in, in divine providence, backed up by hard work. You know, I look back and see all oh, what I have done or what I have and all what I do. And when I was accumulating these skills, I never realized I was accumulating anything. I finished Fabric College. I used my calculator to do statistics. I never used a computer in Fabric College. I went to the United States to do my postgrad, and I, my first course was computer science. Okay, I took that exam, and I, I rose higher than some folks who grew up with computers. That was an eye, an eye opener for me. And then over time, you did a lot of work. Like, I know a lot about IT. I never studied IT, but I worked a lot as a domain, domain knowledge expert for organizations that were disseminating software to countries to do financial management. So I, I came to this bank. The first thing I realized is the core banking system looked pathetic to me. Everybody else said that's good. But because I had that exposure over time, I said, no, look, we need to change this. And now we are going to change it. So you, you acquire knowledge over time. So acquiring skill sets and utilizing the skill sets in a positive manner is one of my main guiding principles. And also not being in the position where you accept, accept explanations, where you accept mediocrity, where you accept sluggishness. Yeah. I will tell you you're sluggish. I will say it to you as a leader. You may not like it. But I'll tell you, look, you're being mediocre. You don't like it. Right now, I'm always correcting people who write me on WhatsApp, especially the younger, younger generation. They use the wrong tense. They spell poorly. I mean, they use synonyms in the wrong, you know, in, 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 in the wrong context. Yeah. And I'll correct you. Say, ah, it's typo. It's not typo. You did not know yeah. the right thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Yeah. If you don't correct people, they won't understand it. So that's one thing I believe. And then I also believe that I am prone to errors myself. So I like to listen. At times I tell people I don't want to hear it. Because if you give me excuses for stuff you should have done, then there is nothing I'm going to gain from the excuse. Yeah. I don't hear about an excuse. I only hear as to why you did not do it. If I want to hear that, then I will always call you and tell me why you not do it. I want to hear as to why you did it and how you made it happen. So if you give me skills once I tell you I don't want to hear it but if you tell me I am going to do it today I expect to meet this type of a problem but I will call you if the problem persists let's see yeah. how we can talk through it at least it's you a tried lot better for me yeah. you have tried and one thing I believe also is believing in yourself don't try mm -hmm. to be a perfect imitation of somebody else right be yourself so I challenge myself I am standard for myself I get angry with myself for not going to the gym when I said I'll go to the gym. For not waking at six when I said I wake up at six. I get angry with myself. I am my own standard. I don't want to be no Shua's nigga because I can never be a Shua's nigga. You know, <laughs> I, I, I want to be myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, and that is, look at yourself and see who, who am I? How can I make myself better? That's another guiding principle for me. And last but not least, there is a star, a, a Nazarene said, if at first you don't succeed, try again. Then your courage would be near. And you would persevere. You will conquer, never fear. Try again. Okay. You know, so these little things help me. You know, and I remember also some nursery rhymes that really messed up my head. Like one nursery rhyme that said, What are little boys made of? Dogs and snakes and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. Then what are little girls made of? 
sugar and spice and all that's nice. That's what these girls are made of. Yeah. So I grew up thinking girls were these angels, these angelic beings, and yeah. the bad things that God put on the world to bring grief to mankind. Only to realize later in life that girls are, can be worse than guys at times. Yeah. So I hated that nausea rhyme forever <laughs> and ever and ever. Yeah. So, you know, fundamentally, you find things that, um, should I say, mess up your mind when you're growing up, and you repair that as you get older. Yeah. And things that you believe can add value to your life, you strengthen those as you go older. So get your principles, hold on to them, and then do your best with God's help to make you who you are. And I believe that as much as I wanted to help my country, to serve my country, to serve my people, God has given me an opportunity to do it now. So as I speak to you, I want to speak to the younger folks out there. Yeah. Do not fear. Do not doubt yourself. Always walk towards being who you are because in you, there's a huge potential. I think you are very inspirational, Doc. Um, I'm sure viewers have actually learned a lot um, based on the things that you've said, your journey. And these are the things that we need in this part of the world, if not the continent as a whole. We want to get people to learn from the, the journeys that successful people have went through, their challenges, and how they were able to, to change, how they were able to adapt, to be agile, and get to the, to the top. So finally, before we leave you, um, Doc, uh, the Me Professionals platform, one of the things we're aiming at is to be able to have professionals like you to mentor the younger generation. So we're asking if um, we have mentorship sessions, we're thinking if, um, if we extend invitations to you, if you'll be obliged to honor and talk to young people to see how we can change the narrative. Because like you mentioned earlier on, there are a lot of problems, there are a lot of things that need to be changed. But with you people doing a lot, and we think things can change. Yeah, you see, um, at a very young age, somebody believed in me. I worked in the Central Bank for four years and I became a head of a whole unit, you know, through an interview process. But somebody believed to identify me to go and take that exam okay. to get to that, 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 that next step. So I was so young that when I go to meetings, they ask me, did Mr. Gibson send you? I said, no, that's me. Said, ah, please, uh, sit down, sit down. I was so young. I was not even 30 yet. You know, I was a whole section leader, maybe just about 30. And you know, to get to that level, you have to be about 50, 40, 48 to get to that level. Wow. So somebody believed in me. Yeah. And I believe in people too, as a consequence, to be able to identify young people, to mentor them. At a young age, I was working as an international consultant. At a young age, I traveled the whole world. I've been to about 45 countries, worked in maybe 38, 39 countries, either doing a short stint there or workshop there, something. And I, at a very young age, I was managing all these projects. So I believe in young people. Given an opportunity, they can do it. So the answer to your question is yes. Okay. If, I, if I'm called upon, I'll be happy to do that and to help young people become who they are. If you got this generation right, I believe we can save the country. Okay. So this is where we actually draw out the contents for today's edition of the program with professionals. Of course, you've heard from the experience and a very decent professional, an economist, of course, and a banker. Till we meet again on the Meet Professional Show, I am your host, IBKB. Thanks for watching the Meet Professional Show. You can also be a professional someday.